Welcome everyone to a new episode of uh, my new show called Get Resource Smart. Due to the success of Get Tech Smart, I wanted to produce a show that puts a spotlight on the various organizations that are right here in New Hampshire that have an abundance of resources for residents. And I bet some of you might not know that these resources are available to you, your friends, your family, and your children. So I'm excited for the launch of the very first episode of Get Resource Smart. And to kick it off, my guest is from a fantastic organization, which is the National Collaborative for Digital Equity. And Bob McLaughlin, I'm happy to have you here. Thank you. So thank you for allowing me to kick off this new episode with you. Oh, I'm honored. This is going to be fun. This is going to be a great episode uh, because of your organization mm -hmm. and the resources that are made available. But before we get mm -hmm. into detail, mm -hmm. uh, because there are various resources, we're going to talk a little bit about who you are and what led you uh, to essentially be one of the founders of uh, Digital Equity. So I, I guess it really comes, uh, goes back in a, a thousand years ago <laughs> to when I was a VISTA volunteer uh, on a reservation in North Dakota for the Tribal College in, and in my early 20s. And in that experience, uh, and it was really an opportunity for me to, uh, to experience the power of education to really open up opportunities and open up hope. And in that experience, uh, I ended up staying there for three years. It was a one-year appointment. I ended up staying there and writing grant proposals and taught GED and a variety of things. And one of the one of many things I learned from that is that how soul-crushing, how there's sort of two big prob big challenges with growing up in, in intergenerational poverty. One is how soul-crushing that can be, and it, and it can it can really lead to uh, you know, a lot of a lot of despair. The other is that that can happen even though it's right next door to this wealth of resources. So it's really it's really apropos your amazing topic for the new series that you're launching, which is that there are so many resources that are out there, and in some cases it's like somebody who's dying of thirst on the in the desert. And there's a lemonade stand just over the next right. dune to the right, <laughs> if only they knew. If only they knew, yes. Yeah. So you have been in the education sector, yeah. uh, and you're a proponent for uh, uh, STEM, mm -hmm. uh, and you're also an advocate for kind of like the integration between technology and education. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we noticed uh, during the pandemic when we were remote uh, was a serious division when it comes to digital equity. So let's dive into that and, and why your organization is critical uh, when it comes to students uh, having uh, accessibility to laptops and broadband internet, for example. So, and you'll appreciate this. So when the, before the pandemic uh, affected us all, uh, I would get often digital what? Right. Digital, di you know, digital equity? Yeah, what, what, what is that? <laughs> right? Digital divide even? Digital divide? What's that? Right. Uh, and if you were on the wrong side of it, you knew exactly what that was. But if you weren't, it was relatively invisible. And what the pandemic did, one of the few aspects of Lemonade in that, was that it really made the digital divide very visible. And schools, as you, as you know and, and, and appreciate, uh, schools where kids didn't have affordable broadband at home and or a device at home, they weren't learning at all. Yeah. And so the pandemic really made that starkly apparent. Uh, that said, what we also, so we have two frameworks that guide our work as a nonprofit. And one is digital, systemic digital equity and the other systemic inclusion. And the systemic digital equity is basically the notion that it ain't so simple. Don't just think in terms of cheap boxes and wires because there's tech support, multilingual tech support. There's librarian support. There's access to quality digital content, whether it's fee-based you know, uh, or free. Uh, there's you know, a variety of things. Uh, and so what we did during the pandemic in Manchester 
was we mobilized with Manchester Proud and the school district and the community college uh, and a network that eventually encompassed 13 banks and six credit unions and said, let's go hammer and tong at getting kids on the right side, all kids on the right side of the digital divide. One of the things that we all learned, which really underscored the multilingual aspect of all this in, in terms of the pandemic, is uh, in linguistically diverse communities like Manchester, where you had 60 or 70 different languages that kids come into school with uh, as non-English, you know, non-native speakers, uh, that you, if you wanted to outreach, you could, it's that, it's that water, that next dune over, that lemonade stand that's next, next you know, dune over. Um, the district working with us and, and bankers and credit unions and foundations and corporate giving programs, we were able to, to pony up the resources to, to buy 500 laptops for wow. kids that didn't have them. Very exciting. And then you offer them, and there were about 30 or 40 families that just weren't taking advantage. And the district had arranged on the bus routes where they were providing food at home on the buses, you know, free of reduced lunch and doing that. So I had a distribution system we could leverage and the district was, it was a really wonderful partnership, but you still had the linguistic barriers uh, that made it um, very challenging. So there's a kind of cultural and linguistic aspect to digital equity that's not just the geeky stuff, right? if that makes sense. Yeah, so what, what is the solution? Because you, you, you bring up so many great points. Uh, one I wanna start tackling with, mm. the people who weren't taking advantage of uh, the free access to these laptops, um, was it because like they, they weren't aware that they were available or was it because they didn't understand what was going on? Because I know some people get worried like, oh, do I have to pay for this laptop? You know. Uh, what happens if something happens to the laptop? What, what do you think was the cause of that? So, so the, the district very wisely undertook a, what they call a root cause analysis process, right? Which is basically, let's unpack that. Right. And, and try to figure out just the, the question you had, what's up with that? Why? This is counterintuitive. You offer the device and we would even get the flyers out in Spanish and in other, you know, uh, um, uh, frequently encountered languages mm -hmm. other than English and even that wasn't quite getting getting um, getting to it and what we found is that those the new Americans uh, you know immigrant and refugee families uh, were um, really hard to reach um, and oftentimes communications would come from the school and there might be um, unfamiliarity with the school system because mm -hmm. they've they have grown up in a Sudanese refugee camp where there there wasn't there wasn't a frame of reference for engaging with the school system you know it was i mean there was a lot of there was a there was a lot of that but the language barriers were the big barrier and one of the things that we learned from that we all learned from that the district and us and Manchester proud and the and the bankers and the the philanthropists the community foundation, all these partners, was that the district really needed to have uh, ownership by linguistically and culturally diverse community leaders mm. of, of the communication system right. and saying, we need to be at the table with you. We need, be de we need to be designing with you. Don't disseminate at us. Right. Disseminate with us and let us be at the table and let us also tell you what are some of our barriers that some of us are so focused on you know we've right. got to, we've got to work three jobs uh, our kids are at home alone and they're 11 and 12 years old and they're raising their siblings we've got other fish to fry right right now than than a laptop and we appreciate mm. this you know, so so we have families in free fall and that's that's what we were hearing and so it was really a matter of changing the relationship between those that you most wanted to reach so that they had voice and agency. Right. Does that make sense? That makes sense, right? Because you can provide the free laptop, yeah. but if the person doesn't have, you know, the internet to be able to connect, yep. <clears throat> excuse me, to use the laptop, yeah. then that laptop is just going to sit there. And and the great example that you bring uh, just brought up right now is that, you know, if they're working three jobs mm -hmm. and the person who's essentially managing that laptop is the child, 
well, the child is not going to know, like, hey, who do I contact, you know, to get the internet? So it's, it, it's a whole program, right? It's a whole, okay, we need the laptop. We need the internet connection. Does the child have the tech support mm -hmm. they need if there are any issues? And in addition to that, um, guidance. Because there's some people who, this might be for their family's first exposure yeah. uh, to working with things like laptops and iPads, uh, and they might not understand. And the child is looking to the parent for guidance, and the parent doesn't have guidance. So what other stuff are you doing? Let's talk about where it's just not a, here's your laptop, but there's, there's more support. So this is a great question. So on, on our website at digitalequity.us, and this is a non-commercial, sort of non-subliminal advertisement, there's a, there's a, under the vision tab, there's systemic digital equity, and it lays out about a paragraph each of different dimensions. So we talk about you know, some of the, this very question around sort of starting with the obvious of affordable access to broadband. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to that in a second, because um, even there we had Comcast with Internet Essentials, which is all you can eat broadband for ten dollars, and the Bean Foundation said we'll cover that. And then we were hearing, well, some families were saying because of of Comcast Internet Essentials policy, if you have a past due TV bill uh, the, for the cable TV, we can't let you get access to the Internet Essentials program. And so the Bean Foundation said we'll cover that too. And, oh, wow. and so, I, so really broadband was, so all those, those digital divide barriers were done away with, but getting the word out in a way that folks believed and connected with it right. remained a challenge. So, so there's affordable access to broadband and devices and tech support. One of the things we did related to your question is in terms of additional capacity building is we look at this as, as not a, a one shot, um, you know, here's, here's a temporary fix it, but how do we try to change right. the whole situation structurally? So we, uh, with support from, uh, from banks and credit unions and the found, uh, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and other partners, we developed a tech support training program for linguistically diverse kids where they got academic credit and they did it as an after school program. Oh, wow. And these kids were leading the charge and that's the kind of yeah, it's really like fun. It's a win, 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 yeah. right? It's community engagement. Kids are getting great skills and they're feeling a sense of pride. And we also secured the funding for the donation of refurbished laptops that kids got to use, the, the teens got to use during the course. Right. And they got to keep them as an incentive for finish the course, hang in there. Uh, and all but one student was able to finish and, and the other student, we let them keep the laptop because the reason why they couldn't stay in the after school course was because their mom had to take on a second job mm. and they literally had to stay home during course hours and they had to watch younger siblings right. kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, and let me also add, which is a, um, the most counterintuitive aspect of digital equity, I think, which is uh, there's a downside to improving access, which is, um, which is potentially very problematic. So let's say we provide all kinds of access, we remove all the digital divide barriers. It, it needs to be about more than just access because there's access to cyberbullying, right. um, a need for media literacy, a need for protection from social media and device addiction. You know, there, there, uh, there's an arms race going on among device manufacturers and among social network engineers like, you know, Pinterest, uh, you know, um, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and others that are trying to make their, their network, their device more addictive than their competitors. And so it actually affects cognition. And there's research that shows that if, if we just provide un unfiltered, unpro right. you know, unprotected access, that what's happening is kids who grow up reading differently, processing differently, and having less capacity to sustain attention. Right, yeah. And we, we kind of feature this issue with social media on an episode yes. of uh, Get Tech Smart uh, with Dr. Uh, Loretta Brady uh, mm. at St. Anselm College, nice. where she talked about seeing uh, a difference between her kids on how they're accessing um, 
information on social media, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's like a whole nother episode. We're not gonna get into that. Mm. So one of the things that is is uh, a huge issue, especially for mm. um, for a lot of students in, in lower income um, households is, is again, just really fully understanding uh, good social media hygiene. Um, and with technology hygiene as well, right? Technology is increasing. We're seeing all these new uh, apps like, you know, chat bots, uh, like chat GPT. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things I recently um, saw last week is that the New York public schools are, and other educators mm -hmm. around the world uh, are really concerned with this introduction of artificial intelligence and these uh, text generator uh, apps, uh, issues with cheating, plagiarism. Mm -hmm. And now we have this one school district in New York, essentially the New York uh, schools are saying, we're gonna ban yeah. uh, chat GPT. Yeah. Um, how can educators continue to teach kids how to leverage technology, how to be more I guess, uh, digital fluent, mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better word, uh, because one of the issues we also have is uh, not just children, but even adults who still struggle uh, just being more digitally sound. So, so, so I, 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 these are great issues, uh, and, and, and Oh my, right? I mean, right. this is, you know, chat GPT is, a, is really an oh my, what right. do we do about this thing now? Right. It's like, oh my. So educators are going, oh, one more, one more mind-bending thing to, 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 to encounter and to try to deal with. So I, I think eventually, it's, and K-12 is gonna, is gonna respond slowly and educator preparation, and I've been in both of these, is gonna respond even more slowly to this through nobody's fault, but just, Descriptively, we're not gonna respond as rapidly as we need to, I believe, in rethinking our pedagogy, rethinking what we do. So we're, st we're, still, we're still grappling with how do we keep kids from, from copying and pasting and plagiarizing? Right. And, and the more that we move away from, do you understand, the co we're gonna quiz you on the content in your essay or in your quiz or your test, and move off of that to, can you be a, a, can you show skill in being a good critical consumer of digital content and being media literate and smart about it, which is more of a a skill than a, can you regurgitate content? Right. You know, and so I I believe we need to move more and more to something that some educators have been calling for for thirty years, which is a more of a competency based approach to how we teach and how we assess. And, and I think that this is just one more challenge that says, you know, if you do this conventionally, kids are gonna find a way to cheat. Right. You know, because if you, as long as you make it about the grade, and if you don't make it about mastering skills that matter, and I, I mean, there's a whole paradigm change that right. needs to happen. I think, and it's something you and I talked about before we started you know, taping this morning, which is, you know, kids are gonna find a way. They'll find a way to do it, yeah. Right. They'll find a way to do it, but I'm also seeing that uh, due to chat GPT, it's triggering other innovation. Yeah. Now there's a senior uh, in, uh, out of Princeton who during his Christmas break, he created an app uh, called, um, I think it's called GPT Zero. Uh, or Chat Zero, uh, I'll put it up uh, once I edit this video. But he created this app that is designed to help educators combat this very issue. Uh, and this app will be able to decipher whether the student uh, wrote the test uh, or the essay, or whether it was a AI platform that wrote the essay or whatever assignment they were given. Um, so, so there's tools out there and that are under development now that mm -hmm. educators can use um, that they can still say to kids, hey, we understand mm -hmm. the need for digital literacy. Uh, instead of banning it, we're going to teach you how to be digitally fluent, but in a truthful mm -hmm. right, way without having to just hit cut and paste. 
Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, that, that really resonates for me. I, I think, um, and I've taught methods courses for future teachers, sort of, you know, teaching future teachers how to teach, what are right. some good methods. And one of the things that I do, which is a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, a misbehaving kind of a thing, I, I suppose, a sort of a minority viewpoint on this, which is um, actually bring your device into, into, into the classroom, you know, future teachers, bring your devices in, and uh, and I'm and I'm not pushing on on you know uh, unfiltered access to devices, but saying let's learn how to use these tools responsibly. Yeah. Let's help kids develop them because they're going to use them. Right. And let's help them to understand better why and how to be more careful with these and to be media right. literate. I think the more that we are providing assignments and assessments that are about. This is a, an important skill. This is why you want to learn it. And let's help you develop it and, and develop that skill and demonstrate right. mastery of it. So for example, the difference between uh, taking a quiz on do you understand the principles of driving a sub to, uh, and use this example because the military is very much performance based because they think that if I understand 90% of driving a sub and I get, a, I get an A on my quiz on driving a sub, but that last 10% that I don't get right, right. will kind of ruin your whole day. <laughs> you know, so they're, they're kind of into mastery, you know, thank you very much kind of thing. And, or targeting a missile or, or, you know, some really important skill. Uh, same in medicine and, and in other fields. And there are skills that can be taught where kids see the value of, like learning to, learning to interview well, right. you'll appreciate, is a really amazing skill. It's listening skills. And if kids see the point to it, and it's not about the grade, it's about the, this is a skill that when you get it, it's going to enhance the quality of her, your life and the quality of the lives of those around you. The yeah. more that we embed the curriculum with essential skills where kids see the point, and it's not hoop jumping for a grade, it's about mastery for, for the, the intrinsic joy and the usefulness of that. And that may sound very idealistic, right. but I think kids respond to that. Um, and unless it becomes about, I, I'm going to game you so that you think I wrote that essay, it's about, you know, I, I, I want to show you uh, it's okay that I do eight drafts of that essay working with you. It's okay that I make mistakes. I don't have to get it where it looks perfect the first time. Right. So it's fewer assignments, deeper learning, uh, and more patiently working with the students, which is a whole mindset uh, change that's actually uh, a lot of educators been, have been about for Right. For several decades. And I think also, too, the thing is you got to be careful what you ban because there, there might be students who have mm -hmm. the availability to access uh, these tools outside of school. And they will get probably further ahead in terms of their experience and their yeah. ability to use those tools. And then you might have students who don't have that access. So we're now further doing that d the divide of uh, digital literacy versus pulling it together. Um, yeah. You know, again, I think that's a great idea. Hey, teachers, let's teach them how to use it. And then one of the issues with Chat GPT that's coming up is right now it doesn't really give um, you know, credit to where it got the information. I saw that. So yeah. maybe that could be a learning opportunity for teachers to say, okay, this is how you use Chat GPT, but if you're going to use it, um, mm -hmm. nope. Be honest, Hon honest, honesty policy, be yeah. honest. But if you mm -hmm. are gonna use it also, you, you need to find the citations. Yeah. You've gotta now go back and research yeah. and try to figure out where ChatGPT got this information so that you can be able to uh, cite it. So technology is great. It's continuing to grow, but I think part of your organization, your focus is making sure that everyone has accessibility to technology. And it's not just students. Uh, do you also work, because I'm noticing during COVID, we had a lot of issues with uh, people with disabilities or mm -hmm. uh, senior citizens as well, not having access to you know, technology and, and being, able, being able to leave their house and get, you know, go to the library and get books, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. um, let's, can we talk about a little bit how you also help um, people with disabilities and senior citizens? Uh, absolutely, and there are a lot of allies too, sort of the wider, you know, get resource smart kind of, kind of challenge too. So there are a lot of allies, not just us, by any stretch. In fact, by the way, one of the things we like to do 
is to not reinvent anybody's wheel. If somebody's already got something figured out, it's like, like there's a program called uh, uh, Cyber Seniors, which is uh, teaching kids how to provide tech support to seniors. Oh, nice. And they got some amazing videos that are hysterically funny. <laughs> and they, they talk about seniors that are, uh, you know, in a senior center, which we'd appreciate, you know, right next door here. Yeah. Uh, where they say, how many of you seniors have used a computer before? And they overlay the sound of crickets in this video. Right. <laughs> and then they talk about teaching kids how to teach seniors how to, and, and that's a free program that's nationwide in partnership with AARP. Any, any uh, teenager can sign up for free, get trained as a, as a tech support provider. Nice. So one of the things we do is to say, you know, we can help the community develop that, but there's already a great program that does that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's, but you're absolutely right that there are, um, in our work, it's all about digital equity for learners of, of all ages. Okay. So, uh, so that's absolutely a focus. And one example is with uh, apprenticeship programs, which are about helping uh, youths and adults go from unemployment and underemployment to living wage employment with U.S. Department of Labor support and Workforce Investment Board support and other kinds of resources to provide an income while they're getting trained for a living wage job. Yeah. And one of the things we've been advocating for is make digital literacy an essential through group competency in that. So that, in other words, there are, there are policy levers that can bake in that capacity building Similarly, the community uh, college system of New mm -hmm. Hampshire, like many states, um, they some community colleges required uh, like a one credit hour course in digital literacy. Our bias is that ought to be an essential food group right. for everybody. So there's there there are easy ways of building capacity um, where it could be game changing for large numbers of folks. Okay, so now you. Let's say there's somebody who's you know attending one of the uh, New Hampshire colleges. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll throw in Manchester Community College, mm -hmm. for example, uh, and they need access to because there's some classes that are now like remote. We're seeing an increase yeah. in in remote classes for yeah. for college college level, um, and they need access to a computer. Are they able to contact your organization and be able to get a computer, or how does that work? Sort of a, a no and yes. So. Okay. Um, well, so yeah, yes, no, yes. So, so the yes part is that we have a partnership with a, a national refurbishing company, Bloom, B-L-U-U-M. And this isn't, you know, this isn't, a, with apologies, so that it's not, a, it sounds salesy. <laughs> um, but there are refurbishers, you know, a lot of refurbishers. Mm -hmm. Microsoft has a program called the Microsoft Authorized Refurbisher Program which is an amazing program for nonprofits like us that will offer ridiculously discounted pricing on Windows 11 and installing Office on a refurbished laptop. Okay. So we take advantage of that. And, and we're not unique in that. Um, and so there are refurbishment programs you know, like ours. Uh, one of the things that we're doing that's a, a bit distinctive is that in addition to putting Office, the full boat of Office on a refurbished laptop and, and Windows 11 is saying, let's also, and this connects with the, the Get Resource Smart part of, of your vision for what you're doing, which is really exciting. So one of the things we do, so when you refurbish a computer, you wipe, you wipe the drive completely clean. Right. And then so that there's no you know, lack of data privacy and you put on the, the operating system, in this case, Windows 11, and we take advantage of putting also Microsoft Office on there. But since you're doing what's called drive imaging, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're putting stuff on the drive, why not put a link to 211, which we do. Which, and 211 is in every state, uh, including New Hampshire. And 211 is the result of, a, of an agreement between United Way National and the FCC to give, in every state, you, that state or and or local chapters of, you know, of United Way dibs on the 211 number. United Way agrees in every state to provide 24/7, 365 staffing oh, wow. of information, you know, information referral specialists. So this is kind of one of these who who knew 
Uh, and so we're saying, well, folks that are low income that are eligible for a free computer. So, mm. and that's part yeah. of the yes part. Okay. So the no is that we don't have a big supply ourselves right. of laptops, but if, and this is the yes part, which is the good news, that we can get banks credit under the Community Reinvestment Act and foundations and others and credit unions that say, we would like to finance 50 laptops for low-income learners. Right. So that's the yes part. So for example, there's a bank that wants to donate them for linguistically uh, diverse adults through the Inter In International Institute for New England, which works with new American families who would love a device and so very cost effectively then, you can get on the device then a right. link to 211, also a link to free checking accounts and financial literacy education. You can use a device, a link to the state library system so that you can see, ah, oh, in my local library, I can get a free library card, I can get, and why I would want to do that, right. what I get access to, and, a, and I can get help from a 211, for my sorry, a reference librarian at my local library to help me use the library as well. It's a domino effect of various resources, yeah. which is why I created this show because mm, I find that there's so it. many resources out there that people don't know about. So real quick before we wrap yeah. up, I yeah. want to bring in that your organization doesn't just focus on digital literacy. You also mentioned financial literacy. So let's talk about that a little bit because that's also something that's very important uh, where we, we do see some kind of uh, divide with low income families in terms of getting financial resources. Yeah, but, and a frame that I, that I think you'll resonate with a whole lot is that our, our bias around poverty is that there are so, it's that, it's that, you know, it's this wealth of resources that are right next to somebody in poverty and, and how siloed they are. Right. So I might know about affordable housing, but I might not know about a pathway to a living wage job, and I might not know about the whole family approach to jobs, which covers my public benefits while I'm getting trained. So that I can actually afford to earn more of an income that otherwise would, would make my kids ineligible for, for subsidized childcare. There, part of the challenge of poverty is not only knowing that a particular kind of resource is there, but being able to create a coherent map of those. And I, and I can tell you by way of confession, not a brag, as a nonprofit, that, that we're supply driven in a sense of, you know, we get funded to do what we do. And we're, we hopefully are pretty good at what we do, but it's only pieces of the puzzle where somebody in poverty, which is why I love 211 so much, it's like, oh, you need a, you need a voucher for, for an Uber to go to a job interview mm -hmm. that will pay you enough, they could actually finance a used car and get off of a bus route so you can have benefits for your kids. It's a game changer, if only for one of a nail, you know, losing a kingdom kind of a thing, for one of an Uber voucher, I could get to a better paying job right. that could change my whole family's, you know, quality of life. That's huge, because there's some people who yeah. They were like, what's the point of even going to look for a job because I don't have the car to get me to that job. And so, Bob, you're going to actually help me get connected with people at 211. Oh, absolutely. Um, that way I can have them on We'd the program so they can really kind of list out all the resources that are available. But so for people with financial literacy, yes. uh, I know you work with the banks. We do. Just talk about briefly some of the sure. services. So I'll that behave you're and try to be linear for right. a minute because <laughs> I'm sure you're going like, to follow the bouncing ball. So, um, so about financial literacy, there is a national initiative called Bank On, mm -hmm. and there are about a hundred state and local Bank On chapters that are all about a couple of things, offering low cost and free checking and financial literacy education often, not always, but I'd say 95% of the time, a bank on coalition will say, we'll connect you up with somebody who'll provide free coaching for you on financial literacy as a kid, or for, for your financial aid borrowing decision, or for that first living wage paycheck, or whatever it is, right. or for you as a minority entrepreneur, and you are really, you make amazing tacos, and you wanna be able to, you wanna get a loan, a micro loan for a taco truck 
and you want to be able to manage your business so you can support your whole family right. with how good you are as a, a, as a gifted maker of you know, tacos and other things, right? So there's financial literacy for all those different purposes. So bank on, there are 17 state bank on coalitions and we have one of them, Bank on New Hampshire. Okay. And these are, these are, these take advantage of a, a federal policy that's down in the weeds that governs banks, that any bank that has FDIC depositor insurance, which is pretty much almost every bank under creation in the US, it be, be, you know, so they have that FDIC depositor right. you know, insured logo on their, on their branch door. That tells you that they have, they have to comply with a requirement called the Community Reinvestment Act that requires you to spend a certain percentage of your assets every year to address poverty, a half a trillion a year, by the way. Wow, that's uh, probably people don't know about this at all. No idea. Okay. And there's a lot that's going on, but it's very siloed. And it's for adults in poverty, it's not for kids, and it's compliance driven, not impact. In addition to spending under the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA, they also were required to do volunteerism. And federal agencies audit the, the banks, the FDIC insured banks, at least every three years for volunteerism too. One of the most common purposes that a bank will do volunteerism is financial literacy. Mm -hmm. So that, and banks are, you know, they, you know, like anybody else, they, they want at the end of the day be proud about they've made a right. difference in somebody's life. And so as a nonprofit, if you're working with somebody who needs financial literacy, a bank will appreciate you saying, will you connect us to somebody that can provide free coaching for us? Right. So, and financial literacy can come in. I see some people who have low credit or bad credit and they don't know how to even start, where to start to clean yeah. that up so they can get finance into buy a home or finance mm -hmm. a car or, or anything else, a credit card, for example. Yeah. So that falls into that category. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I love everything that you're doing with oh, digital equity, financial you. literacy. Uh, I can't wait to get connected with uh, the people at 211 because that seems like something that uh, a lot of people in this community and other communities across New Hampshire would appreciate to know more information about. And they will be very grateful right back. Yeah, so I'm really excited for our very me, first me episode too. of Get Resource Smart. Uh, stay tuned for more episodes. If you are a nonprofit organization or, or any organization really uh, that has resources available that benefits residents right here in the community, whether it's students, low income, minorities, elderly, people with disability, veterans, I welcome you to come on this show so we can share this information out. So we make sure that the people who need these resources mm -hmm are getting access to these resources and they get access to the resources by guess what? Knowing they're available, right? And that's the critical piece. Uh, so Bob, thank you so much oh, for you. coming on the show. Uh, if you have any updates or anything additional that you wanna share with us, you're welcome back anytime. I look forward to it. Thank you, Flo, that's what an great. honor. Thank you. And thank you to everyone else for watching. And remember, uh, we have a partnership with the Granite State News Collaborative, and they will continue to help me amplify my message across New Hampshire.